Welcome to week two of Writing in the Sciences. I'm Kristen Sinani from Stanford University. Last week, we had an overview of three key principles of effective writing. And we talked about the first of those, which was cutting all the clutter, all the unnecessary words and phrases from your sentences. This week, I'm going to focus on the latter two principles, which both had to do with verbs. So the first one is we're going to talk about the use of the active voice. And then we'll talk about writing with verbs, using strong verbs, avoiding turning verbs into nouns, and keeping the main verb of your sentence up near the subject close to the beginning of the sentence. So what is the active voice? So the active voice follows the format subject, verb, object. And this is the way that we normally talk, right? We say, she drives the car, she throws the ball. It's a very uh, normal way uh, of talking and a normal way of writing. And if you, as you'll see in a minute, if you change over to the passive voice, it starts to sound very awkward. So I really want you to start thinking about using the active voice. And some of you may have learned, uh, picked up along the way, the habit of using the passive voice. So to help break you of that habit, I'm going to suggest that next time you sit down to write, you actually kind of have this mantra in your head. You think subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, and just kind of get that beaten into your head uh, and remind yourself that you're supposed to write subject, verb, object. So uh, again, the active voice is just subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, and sometimes it's just subject, verb. It doesn't always have to have an object. All right, so contrast that to the passive voice. What does the passive voice look like? So the passive voice inverts that structure. It goes object, verb, subject, or sometimes just object, verb, and the subject is actually completely removed out of the sentence. And you can see it's a very kind of awkward way if you try to talk this way. Uh, you would say instead of she throws the ball, you would say the ball was thrown by her, or the ball is thrown by her. And you can see that's a really awkward way to talk. And so we never talk in the passive voice, but yet somehow when we sit down to do academic or scientific writing, a lot of us start to, uh, you know, talk in the passive voice in our writing. And it's also very awkward in writing. The classic example of the passive voice is the following sentence. Mistakes were made. Now notice that's in the passive voice because the object, what was made, was the mistake. So the object starts that sentence, then we get the passive verb, were made, and then there's no subject. So we don't know who made the mistakes, right? They just kind of fell out of thin air. They just happened. Mistakes were made. Nobody's responsible. So the passive voice is a way that you can talk that sort of abdicates your responsibility, right? And so that's one of the reasons that it exists in the English language. You can recognize the passive voice by looking for the passive verb. And that verb will have two parts to it. It will have a form of the verb to be, that's is, are, was, were, be, been, or am. And then it will have a main verb that will be in the past tense. And that main verb has to take an object. It's what we call a transitive verb. Uh, it, it has to take an object or you won't be able to invert it into the passive voice. So a verb that takes an object would be again like, she throws the ball. So the verb throws in that sentence takes the object, the ball. Contrast that to the sentence, she runs, where you're just talking about the athletic activity of running. If you say she runs, in that sentence, run does not take an object, so there's no way to turn that into the passive voice. However, if you said she runs the company, then you could turn that into the passive voice because in that sentence, run takes an object, the company. So then you could say the company is run by her. So that's the passive voice. And uh, you can recognize it by looking for, again, a form of the verb to be connected to the past tense of the main verb. And what, is the, what are the to be verbs, just to remind you, in case you've forgotten, those are is, are, was, were, be, been, and am. And sometimes the be or the been is paired with something else, like you might see could be, or shall be, or will be, or has been. But you're looking for one of those uh, to be verbs. So how do you recognize the passive voice? So you're looking for the passive verb that is a verb that's a, a to be verb connected to uh, another verb in the past tense. Or you can just look for the structure object, verb, subject. So you kind of figure out what's the object of the sentence, what's the subject, and have those been inverted. Uh, and again, sometimes you will just see object, verb. That's an easier sentence to recognize as being in the passive voice because since there is no subject, it's pretty obvious that that's in the passive voice. So you're looking for object, verb, subject, or just object, verb. And I'm going to try to get you in the habit of recognizing the passive voice so that you can turn it back into the active voice.
So here's an example of a passive voice sentence. I took this sentence from Strunk and White. Uh, it's a very classic little book. If you want to pick up something else to read for this class, it's called The Elements of Style. It's very short. It's very good. Uh, so if you have some time and want to pick something up to read, I think you can even get that one uh, online. So they uh, wrote the sentence, my first visit to Boston will always be remembered by me. So you can see when you read that out loud how awkward and funny sounding that is, right? We don't talk in the passive voice. So that you can recognize that as the passive voice because it starts with the object. So you think about what was remembered. The visit was remembered. So the visit is the object of the verb remember. So here's my object. Then you get a passive verb. And again, you can recognize the passive verb because you have a form of the verb to be. So we've got will be. And then you've got the past tense of uh, the verb that takes the object. So that's the remembered. So here's the verb. And then you get the subject at the end of the sentence. That's me, right? The subject is me in the sentence. So we get object, verb, subject. So how would you turn that back into the active voice? Well, of course, you would just say, I will always remember my first visit to Boston. That's a much more natural way to speak. And yet, in a lot of academic and scientific literature, we do this in our writing. We, we give that first version. My first visit to Boston will always be remembered by me. So you can see how, how funny that is and also how hard on the reader. So here's another example of a passive voice sentence. So it says, she is loved, which of course brings up all sorts of uh, interesting questions like who is loving her. Um, this is an example of a passive voice sentence in which there is no subject. So you can recognize the, the passive verb again because we have the to be verb is, and then we have loved, which is the past tense of love, which is a verb that takes an object. So you usually love something. So we get our passive verb there. And then you think about, well, what's the she in this sentence? The she is not the one doing the loving. So she is not the subject. She is the one being loved. So she is the object of the love. And who is loving her? Well, we don't know that. That's, that remains a mystery. So this is an example of a passive voice sentence where the subject has been completely removed and leaving it to be you know, somewhat of a mystery. Here's another example of a passive voice sentence in which the subject has been omitted from the sentence. So it says, cigarette ads were designed to appeal, especially to children. So notice again, we've got the passive verb, the were designed, and the object, what was designed, is the cigarette ads. Now, who designed them? Well, when you read this, it's almost like they just kind of were designed that way. It just happened. It wasn't intentional. Nobody did it. Nobody's responsible. It just happened that way. So you can see, again, why uh, people might want to use the passive voice in some cases. It takes away the subject. It takes away the responsible party. So contrast to that passive voice sentence to the active voice version, which would be something like, we designed the cigarette ads to appeal especially to children. So you can see that when you turn things into the active voice, it forces you to then have a responsible party. So how do you turn the passive voice back to the active voice? So first of all, you have to recognize when a sentence is in the passive voice. That's the first step. Then to turn it back to the active voice, you have to ask yourself the question, who does what to whom? Who is the subject of that sentence? Who is the object? and you want to then invert that sentence back to subject, verb, object. In some cases, there won't be a subject. Some of the editing exercises we're going to do, there won't be a subject. So you might have to guess you know, that the subject is we or the authors of the paper. So here's an example of a passive vo voice sentence that we can turn back into the active voice. So it says, by applying a high resolution 90 degree bending magnet downstream of the laser electron interaction region, the spectrum of the electron beams could be observed. So you can see that that's the passive voice because, well, first of all, we don't have a subject here. We don't know who's doing the observing. We know what was observed, the spectrum of the electron beams, but we don't know who was doing the observing. Then we've got the could be, that's the form of the verb to be, and then we've got the observed, the past tense of a verb that takes an object. So to turn this one back to the active voice, we kind of have to guess who's the subject of the sentence. Well, if this was coming out of a scientific manuscript, probably it's the authors who are writing the paper. So they could say something like, the active version would be, we could observe the spectrum of the electron beams by applying a high resolution 90 degree bending magnet. So you have to identify the subject, in this case it's probably the authors, and they can use the word we in their paper, we could observe this, to turn that into the active voice.
So here's another example. It says general dysfunction of the immune system has been suggested at the leukocyte level in both animal and human studies. Okay, so again, this one's a little bit more hidden, but if you kind of look at it carefully, you can recognize it as passive voice because we've got the has been, that's the form of the verb to be, the suggested, and what's the object? What's being suggested? What's being suggested is this dysfunction of the immune system. What's doing the suggesting in this case is the studies, the animal and human studies. So to turn this one back into the active voice, we would put the animal and human studies first and have them suggesting this conclusion. So we would say, both human and animal studies suggest that diabetics have general immune dysfunction at the leukocyte level. And notice that when I wrote it in the active voice, I, I added this word, uh, that diabetics. It actually kind of forced me to be a little less ambiguous. And the active voice often forces you to be more specific about what you're talking about. So uh, I've now put that one into the active voice. It's the studies that are suggesting this finding. And I actually had to give it a little bit more specificity there. It's this particular finding in diabetics. So here's another example. Increased promoter occupancy and transcriptional activation of P21 and other target genes were observed. Okay, so again, this is passive voice without a subject. So we don't know who was doing the observing. Obviously from the context of the paper, we, we could guess that. In this case, I'm gonna assume it was the authors of the paper who were doing the observing. So we would turn this into the active voice by saying, we observed increased promoter occupancy and transcriptional activation of P21 and other target genes. And that's just a much more easy to read sentence. And all I've done is taken that first sentence, which was in the passive voice, and turned it into the active voice. And just that little change makes a big difference in the readability of that sentence. So here's another example in the passive voice. The activation of calcium channels is induced by the depletion of endoplasmic reticulum calcium stores. So you can see that the passive voice also is kind of like the cause and effect come backwards, right? It's the effect was, was caused by the, the cause, right? So um, it kind of inverts everything. So we have to again think about, well, what's the subject here and what is the object? So the subject, what's doing the inducing, is the depletion of endoplasmic reticulum uh, calcium stores. What's being induced is the activation of calcium channels. So again, we're gonna wanna turn that around. And turning this around, you'll see, is gonna make this sentence a lot easier to read and a lot clearer. So we would say, depleting calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum activates calcium channels. And notice that I got rid of one of these uh, extra words here because we had, you know, that the depletion was inducing the activation. And when you put it in the active voice, you can see that you've got to get these two verbs. It induced in, well, activation is a, a noun that could have been a verb. So I took that activation and turned it back to the verb and I got rid of the induced part because I didn't need to kind of say activates twice. So that makes that sentence a lot shorter, a lot crisper. So depleting calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum activates calcium channels. It's very direct. So that's one of the nice things about the active voice is it kind of forces you to be direct. It gives you a lot of opportunities to cut extra words and to be really direct. So here's another example. In the passive voice, it says, additionally, it was found that pretreatment with antibiotics increased the number of super shutters while immunosuppression did not. So notice that how that sentence starts. It was found that. So again, we don't know who did the finding. Um, it's, you know, probably the authors of the paper. Uh, you could turn that into the active voice simply by saying, we found that pretreatment with antibiotics increased the number of super shedders. Uh, however, you could even be a little bit more direct. You could even do a little better than that because probably this is in the results section of their manuscript and they probably don't need to start every sentence with we found that or it was found that. They can just say what was found. So they can actually, you can cut out that whole little kind of clear in your throat, it was found that, and just say directly what was found. So in that case, the pretreatment with the antibiotics becomes the subject. It's the pretreatment with the antibiotics that increases, that does the action, that increases the number of super shedders. So we could rewrite this one in the active voice, getting rid of completely the whole found verb to pretreating the mice with antibiotics increased the number of super shedders while immunosuppression did not.
The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.